And then our next speaker is Dian Jen Lin, um, who's the wonderful winner of the Caring Award for Sustainable Fashion. She was born and raised in the Taiwanese countryside and has an innate awareness of the symbiosis between humanity and nature, and particularly interested in science, technology, and ecological ethics. Her project, Regenerative Sustainability Activism, aims to make sustainability as easy and accessible as putting on an item of clothing. And she has begun developing post-carbon fashion materials with photosynthetic or pollution filtering properties that can absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which will ex she will explain in more detail in her talk <coughs> about post-carbon fashion tonight. So, Jian Chen. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, I'll probably uh, have those uh, textiles on the side as well, <laughs> so I can talk about them in a bit. <laughs> um, so, um, hello everyone. <laughs> I would like to start tonight's uh, talk with this prompt. What if, by wearing a t-shirt, you can make our environment better? But it's not a bit weird, but we'll get to the details in a bit. So let's talk about who I am and why I'm here. So my name is Dianjin Lin. It's kind of hard to remember. You can call me DJ or Dijon. And my, <laughs> my motto is that design should always be drenched in sustainability and dignity. And in terms of how we define dignity and sustainability, we'll get to the later slides. And I uh, currently define myself as an interdisciplinary designer slash researcher. Um, so, as Ursula and uh, Sophie pointed out, the lexicon in terms of um, how we communicate sustainably is a bit not so right at the moment. So, I started with this uh, philosophy which I framed as regenerative sustainability activism. Let's talk about where we are at right now in terms of sustainability. So we have, oh, I don't know if you can read those <laughs> tiny fonts. So if you see from the right corner there, uh, let's say uh, if we uh, give environmental burden to minus 10 and then to environmental benefit to plus 10. Our global sized um, large scale production is probably minus 10, probably in terms of uh, you know, fast fashion. And maybe localized small scale production is a bit less, minus 5. And then what we're doing right now in terms of sustainability is, say, chemical recycling or textile waste, downcycling, you know, making textile waste into installation of architectural uh, usage, or textile waste recycling or upcycling. And then we have now more, as we can see, in sustainable fashion businesses in terms of natural dye or eco materials, which are not causing environmental burden nor, well, environmental benefit at the moment. So what I'm pushing f uh, forward in terms of regenerative sustainability activism is to have perhaps a photosynthesis material or to have pollution filtering material. And at the moment we see sustainability as the quality of not being harmful to the environment or depleting natural resources and thereby supporting our long-term ecological balance. But what's missing is in that um, it's not regenerative. Regenerative sustainability advocates that um, we tackle the blind spot of passively alleviating our environmental burdens. So what if we can possibly uh, positively regenerate, de detoxing and purifying our surroundings to accelerate the environmental catharsis? So with this philosophy adding on design activism, which then I framed it as regenerative sustainability activism, this uh, would be able to inspire more designers to draw their attention to this underdeveloped space for more environmentally beneficial products or designs. So if we put this, imagine if all the businesses that we are know, we, we all, uh, are familiar with, work with regenerative sustainability activism. We will be able to give consumers a very easy way to engage with sustainability or positive environmental impact from an industrial level, and then fashion can act as an activism channel for change. Why don't we change our lexicon instead of being less harmful to the environment to environmentally neutral and even push that further to environmentally beneficial? Talk about 
regeneration and detox instead of mitigation or offset. So I started my research project to developing a photosynthesis material according to this regenerative sustainability activism. And since the fashion industry possess a really great influence for its omnipresence, with our collective wheel, we were able to save the ozone hole. Remember back in the beginning of the 21st century, everybody was talking about ozone depletion? Like with, um, um, and then later on these days, we learned that actually with the legislation, education and media communication in place, now the ozone hole is shrinking because we've banned CFCS, which is the chemical that uh, resulted to ozone depletion. And why don't we let fashion lead the next reversal of global warming? So I started with my uh, research, which is um, developing this photosynthesis material, starting with inoculation onto the fabric, which I use uh, photosynthetic microorganisms. And then you uh, soak them into culture mediums until it reaches the desired growth. You remove them from the medium and then air dry. So then you have this living material that you can keep taking care of, and then by wearing it, you know, doing your work in the office, working on your laptop, it does photosynthesis for you. It absorbs carbon dioxide from the air while generating oxygen that you can freshly absorb, and also, you know, benefiting your surroundings. Um, so the, the interaction of the post-carbon material is that it's capable to um, turn CO2 from the top into O2 by only relying on sunlight or any sort of indoor light source af after my research. And then also just a little bit of sprinkle every day, water. And then it would be able to conduct this photosynthesis as long as it's alive. So with this new material, imagine a post-carbon t-shirt you're wearing Say, if you're small or medium size, you would have 6,000 uh, square centimeter of surface area. If it's completely covered by this culture, you're able to generate 0.7 to 8 amount of oxygen that's generated by a tree in one day. And if today you wear a medium to large size t-shirt, you're able to generate more oxygen than the tree in one day. <laughs> So this is about uh, this is my project. You can follow me on Instagram, which I only started freshly, and please follow me. And I have my <laughs> website and email if you're interested. So this is a part of my slides. And today I actually came uh, in the place of Martin, who is my wonderful colleague at the Sustainable Angle. And I have a few of these uh, commercially available textiles here for you guys to see. So we, um, annually we host um, the Future Fabrics Expo, which actually just ended in January. It's about three, four days, and it's actually not so far from here in the Iris studio. So if you look up online, you'll be able to follow us. We also have a, uh, a virtual expo. So it's perhaps interesting to <laughs> for designers to know that um, it's very, very difficult sometimes to source your materials. It's because um, sustainable um, manufacturing processes um, are very excluded in very, very small, um, uh, small parts of the world. So for instance, here I have this one from Flavia, which is um, harvested from wild robber in the Amazonian rainforest. They work with social um, enterprises, which then allow them to uh, employ indigenous people and uh, stop rainforest deforestation. And then they can, as you can see here, it's wonderful, great colors, and you can, these, you can use these to make bags or shoes. And then, here I have also Fru Matte, which is an apple leather, and it's made using uh, post-industrial waste. You know, uh, if you buy apple juice, all the, all, all the puree, they use all these puree to make uh, this amazing leather you can see here. As you can see, um, from the leather industry, there are a lot of toxins involved in terms of tanning processes and also the ethical problem in terms of killing the animal. I know some of them, they say they're a byproduct of the meat industry, whatever, but I mean, I believe a lot of people here are perhaps vegan or vegetarian at least. 
So if we have these apple leather alternative, why do we still use the leather? And this is from post-industrial waste. And then um, here we have the quite famous peanut tax, which is also from pineapple waste. Uh, they use these corps, uh, co coarse uh, pineapple fiber to, use it, uh, to make this pineapple leather, which is really, really sturdy. And they also were able to make um, waterproof coating, wh which, you can <laughs> which, which you can make to, uh, wh which you can use to make bags or shoes, which are really amazing. And then this one is uh, organic cotton colors. It's perhaps interesting for you to know that a lot of times we see cotton as white. And that's what we uh, properly acknowledge from the cotton balls they grow. But this company, they use no dyeing process at all. And cottons are actually not grown in just white colors. They grow in brown and green and yellow, all these different types of shades. And this company doesn't dye them, they just use the organic natural color to grow and spin the textiles. <laughs> I know I've been. So in, in, in Sustainable Angle, we really try hard to diversify our fiber baskets. Instead of use c using cotton, you can perhaps try using linen or hemp. And think about what are the alternatives to leather. Use, there are so many, so many great um, innovations or eco-materials that are coming up. And these innovations really need everybody's energy and power to support them to keep the innovations and to help transform the fashion industry a little bit better. Okay, thank you. <laughs>